Uh, so just uh, since Ross pointed out that not everyone might get the reference, if you don't understand what the reference is, then I encourage you to skip my talk and go watch The Princess Bride instead. Uh, but if you don't want to skip my talk, uh, this is work that uh, was in large part done by my former student, Spencer Bauman, but also in collaboration with uh, Jeremy, who's here, and Carl Friedrich, who's a collaborator of ours as well. So today I'm going to talk about why sound gradual typing is perhaps not yet dead, or maybe only mostly dead, or some other moderately acceptable uh, state. So let's, let's get started. So I want to start with a murder mystery, uh, thinking about the death of sound gradual typing. Now in 2006, uh, we had, 2006, we started sound gradual typing and uh, we, Jeremy and I, uh, published some papers, which uh, apparently you can't see on the screen. Uh, but uh, today, there's reasonably widely used academic systems, including one that I built uh, typed racket, uh, about on typed racket that <coughs> people actually use to do gradual typing. Now, the idea of gradual typing is that we want to be able to interoperate between statically typed programs and dynamically typed programs. And if you were here last session for Avik's talk, you heard about how they're doing that at Facebook. This is something that we wanted to make easy, but also to maintain the kinds of invariance that we expect from typed programming languages. And that's what we mean by sound, that when we do typed programming, we should get the sorts of behavior that we expect from popular, well-understood typed programming languages, be they Haskell or Java or ML or Rust. Uh, but gradual typing hasn't just been popular in academia. It's also been popular in industry. So TypeScript is one of the, I guess, 10 most popular programming languages these days. TypeScript is a gradually typed variant of JavaScript being developed by Microsoft. It's how they're writing their newest version of Visual Studio, all written in TypeScript. Uh, one of the most popular languages on GitHub tons of people using this, people using this internally at Microsoft to write millions of lines of code. Hack is a gradually typed variant of PHP that uh, Facebook uses for a high percentage of their code, maybe all of it these days, that runs the back end of their website. Flow is a static, uh, gradually typed language for JavaScript, also produced by Facebook, it's extremely widely used internally at Facebook, as Avik told us last session, also used by lots of people outside of the company. And I just uh, last week heard about a new gradually typed language building on Lua for people who want to do statically typed programming there. So this is something that's become popular in almost every dynamically typed language community. You see this in Python as well. Uh, tons of other languages. However, every single one of these systems abandons the ideas that Jeremy and I set out with, that is soundness of gradual typing. They don't do any sort of checking to make sure that the interoperation between typed and untyped parts of your programs follows any sort of rules at all. That means that the kinds of guarantees that you expect, like when you see the type integer in your program, that that's going to produce an integer, well, that's just out the window. Now, hopefully, this is still a useful tool, and the fact that they are still useful tools is why these unsound systems have been widely adopted. 
but this is still a disappointing outcome, I think, for those of us who originally set out to build sound systems. Now, what, what has caused this uh, unfortunate uh, result? So here's a quote from actually someone who I've worked with a lot, developing type bracket. Interfacing type bracket and racket code may involve a lot of dynamic checks, which can have significant overhead and causes that kind of stuttering. This is a person whose GUI application was not doing the right thing because it was too slow. Here's maybe the person who's written the most code in type bracket of anyone, even more than I have. Here's, it's very slow, referring to the, an application that they had built that causing slowdowns because of values going back and forth between in the untyped part of the program. Here's, uh, I don't know if John is in the audience, but here's another person who's used type bracket and he discovered sadly the resulting dynamic checks will probably cause them here a uh, data structure that was written in type bracket to be unacceptably slow. Here unacceptably slow meant instead going from operation that was log n in the size of the data structure to n squared in the size of the data structure. Uh, so that's not so good. And in fact, uh, it's very sad that you can't see this picture, uh, the two years ago, some of my close friends wrote a paper in which they just uh, wondered whether this was even a viable uh, system. They asked whether sound gradual typing was in fact dead. And here's a quote from that paper. The problem is that according to our measurements, the cost of enforcing soundness is overwhelming. Now, overwhelming sounds bad. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look at an example of this. Uh, so here's a uh, one program that they looked at, and the thing I really want you to under, that's called synth, the sound synthesizer, and let's first look at a couple numbers here, just to get a sense for how bad things are. The maximum overhead caused by gradual typing, caused by soundness here, was 85x. So that means the program was 85 times slower than it should have been just because of gradual typing. And the average overhead was about 40x. Now I wanna focus in on this picture. So here's, this is called a density function and what it's visualizing is if we're at this point then this is all of the different ways of making this program gradually typed. And this many of them have, or this many of them have less than 15x overhead. So that's about 15% are less than 15x overhead. And if you wanted something acceptable like 2x overhead maybe, uh, then you've basically got nothing at all. So we're in serious trouble. So they conclude by saying that if this is a repeatable phenomenon, then sound gradual typing is not a viable approach, and we're stuck with the sorts of trade-offs that you get with unsound systems like the ones that have become popular in industry. So uh, to remedy that, we're going to turn to our uh, friend and collaborator, Miracle Max, who is going to help us resuscitate sound gradual typing by uh, bringing the soundness back from the dead. And we're going to do that with an a tool that we've been working on called Picket. Picket is a virtual machine for Racket 
that runs unmodified racket programs. So we're going to not make any changes at all to the approach to gradual typing, the benchmark program we're looking at, or anything else about the setting. In some of the other talks in this session, you'll hear about some other ways of changing the setting to make life a little easier and the good performance results they get. But we're looking at exactly the same programs that we saw overheads of 85x. And we're going to work on fixing that. And here is the most important result in our paper. So I want to take some time and explain what this picture means. So here we've looked at every benchmark of which there's about 10,000 different variations of programs that we examined. Um, and we've ordered them from most to least in terms of how much overhead they suffer. And then on the y-axis is also how much they suffer in the two different systems we're comparing. So in the original paper, so of course, this is, we get y equals x for that virtual machine. We're plotting the same data against itself. In our system, in Picket, you get the blue points. So, for example, this point suggests that we had one piece of, one benchmark, it suffered 60x overhead before, and now we suffer about 10x overhead. So 10x overhead's not great, but fortunately that's well above this yellow line, which is the best fit linear regression. And we see that the slope of this is about 0.09. So we're removing more than 90% of the o overhead sort of on average uh, in this system. So, and this is with exactly the same programs that we had before. And let's go back and look at that individual program that we saw that very unfortunate CDF graph for, and let's examine it again in Picket. First, let's look just at the solid lines here. The red solid line is the same line that we had before uh, from the previous paper. And then the blue solid line is exactly that program running on our virtual machine. So we've gone from, say, 3% of the program suffering a less than 4x slowdown to 50% suffering a less than 4x slowdown. So that significant improvement. Then it turns out that there were also some inefficiencies in the implementation of type, its gradual typing approach that were unnecessary. For example, in one case we were converting back and forth between representations of casts on every time we performed a cast, doing a bunch of allocation, converting, and then converting back. Now when we remove inefficiencies like that, we get these dashed lines. So that, of course, helps things on the regular racket virtual machine. Significantly, this is a three or four fold increase here, but, and it also helps things on picket. So what you see is that now, say, for less than 4x overhead, we get about 95% of the programs instead of 5% of the programs. So that's, uh, of course, 4x overhead is far from a great result. That's why we're describing this as only mostly dead. But many people accept a 4x overhead in their language choice. Anyone who's decided to write their program in Ruby instead of in C++ is accepting a uh, performance overhead that probably belongs well out on the right side of this graph. Uh, and if you're understandably unwilling to accept an 85x, we 
we think that we've already shown that we can reduce that to something more like 3 or 4x. In the worst case, many programs are significantly closer to the best case, which is just a vertical line right here. So how do we make this happen? Two important ideas that I want to talk about. Well, I'm going to focus on one of them today. You can read about hidden classes for in the paper. But the key idea is exploiting what's known as tracing just-in-time compilation, which we get by building on the PyPy language implementation framework. So how does tracing work? So let's consider how a cast, sort of fundamental primitive in gradual typing, works in type tracking. Here we've got uh, an untyped function that just adds one to its input, and we're casting it to be a typed integer to integer function, and that's going to be f. So when we implement this, we follow the, we turn this into a function that takes an input, casts that input to an integer, applies our function, and then casts the result back to an integer. This is the standard approach to decomposing higher order casts that we get from Findler and Felizen's work on higher order contracts. But to implement this in a robust way that fits with all of the abstractions you want to have in system, you've got a much simpler, a much more complicated program where we've got a checked function structure that has the various casts, and we've got a bunch of unknown function calls extracting things from data structures that are going to be much slower than this original function. So tracing is going to go through the execution of, say, f of x, and it's going to get a bunch of, ex read these fields, check that we really got an integer, do the addition, check that the result is an integer, and return it. And then when we optimize this trace, which, thanks to tracing JIT compilation, is a straight line piece of code, we can hoist these accesses to immutable fields out of the loop. We can prove that an integer plus one is always an integer. And suddenly, we have optimized code that has eliminated the kind of indirections that we saw previously. And that's what produces much of the benef performance benefit that we've seen. So here's all the rest of the benchmarks that we present in the paper with the same color scheme can see that we're going from the red lines to the blue lines, and in every case, we're moving way up by switching to our new virtual machine. So in the paper, you can see information about hidden classes for chaperones. We've reported benchmark results for the impact of each optimization we perform, and we talk about the important interaction between finding loops in a just-in-time compiler and wrappers that might interfere with the connections that you see in a loop system. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that mostly dead is slightly alive, and we report that uh, we can have dynamic types and static types live soundly and happily ever after using our new Picket virtual machine. So uh, thank you very much.